YouTube friends and fans, you have reached the Fred and John Talks YouTube channel. Fred is going to say a little introductory prayer for us right now. Sure enough. We do this every time before our videos. Yes, but especially today because we're doing the episode on independent and uh, the theme is Independence Day, July 4th, celebrated in America. And so, God, we ask you to bless our efforts. We ask you to bless our audience. We ask you to bless our country, which in our time is so deeply divided. And we um, entrust our care to you as a loving father, uh, as someone who cares about us and watches over us, um, watch over America, and uh, pour out your blessings, especially as we celebrate Independence Day. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Fred. Well, let me tell you something, Fred. America's birthday is a very special day. You know, America has, during the time it was becoming a nation, it's always been full of fighting, challenges, bloodshed, actually almost like a war of wills to try and find uh, a way to help the human spirit have freedom, independence, and faith, be able to practice your faith. Mm. To me, that was one of the reasons why we left the British Empire, right. but to seek a land and a place where we could fulfill these purposes. And always in doing that, you still have to stand against tyranny. Ah, tyranny. That uh, sparks a question for me right from the start. Do you mind if I ask it? Go right ahead. Okay. Uh, can you give us um, some of your own examples of freedom? I'm a, I'm a cowboy from Kansas. And one thing that always meant a lot to me when I went through some museums over in Washington, D.C., I came across a picture of Sitting, Sitting Bull. Bull. He was a Lakota Indian chief. And the picture is from 1977. And here's what he's quoted as saying, Fred. Sitting Bull says, look at me and look at the earth. It was our fathers and should be our children's after us. That's a powerful thing. These are the Native American Indians who were here before white men or the Europeans came. And it was their land. They hunted, they fished, they clothed themselves, they fed themselves, and then white men came. But I, it's such a powerful thing. It is our. It was our fathers. Their, their parents before them and they were hoping that it would be their children's after them and that was not to be as yeah. we know American history did not treat the Native American yeah. Indians. manifest destiny yeah absolutely he goes on to say if the white men take my country where can I go I have nowhere to go I cannot spare it and I love it very much let us alone so this was sitting bull in mm. 1877 making this quote and that's almost that that's appropriate today where, you know, where would we go if we didn't have freedom if we didn't have our land for your children and my children it's a very prophetic thing to, to say prophetic and profound very profound some of my other research led me to think about uh, slavery we've been able to, um, in America, free slaves, change regulations, laws, federal laws. President Lincoln helped free the slaves. And I came across information that even being an old Kansas boy, I didn't even know about <clears throat> Kansas. And here's something <clears throat> historical about Kansas. Uh, the fighting over slavery in the Kansas Territory Shadowed the Civil War. So I'm talking about a period of time before 1874 77, this in, in earlier 1800s, um, whenever Kansas and Nebraska was called <clears throat> the Kansas Territory. Yeah. 
and determining the status of slavery in the new Western territories had long been a troubling issue for the federal government. In the 1800s. Early 1800s. <laughs> Early 1800s. So our federal government was beginning to realize that slavery and independence was a, big, was a very big deal. In 1854, the matter became critical when Congress passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act. It split the Nebraska Territory into two parts and authorized settlers in each area to choose whether they would allow or prohibit slavery. So Kansas and Nebraska were separated. Split started early. Split started early. But this also tells you again, Fred, that states' rights determine what happens in that state. Mm -hmm. So that's almost like a gift in a way. You get a gift of freedom of determining what's going to happen in your territory. Mm -hmm. And that links through all the way to today. This is a good history lesson. <clears throat> it's a good history lesson. Mm -hmm. I mean, I learned a lot by looking the thing, at The thing that comes to mind is all that you're saying, you know, is what led up to the Civil War. Yes, yes. <laughs> and the presumption was whenever uh, Congress passed this Kansas-Nebraska Act, the presumption was that Nebraska would vote to be free and Kansas would support slavery. And wh that didn't happen. Okay, that did well, not happen. For, for the next seven years, pro-slavery and anti-slavery settlers in Kansas battled over the issue, often resorting to bloody violence. There you are. Huh? Bloody violence. Now, there was an interesting development in that act. It was Stephen Douglas was the politician in Congress. The famous one who debated Lincoln. Yes. And here's what he said about this turmoil that was going on during those seven years. He said, if the people of Kansas want a slaveholding state, let them have it. And if they want a free state, they have a right to it. And it is not for the people of Illinois or Missouri or New York or Kentucky to complain whether the decision of the people of Kansas may be. Isn't that interesting? Yes. So here again, you come along with the idea of because you're from Connecticut, I'm from Kansas. If if the Kansas people live a certain way on the plains, in the out in the outback, in, in outback of America, in the outback of America, and if you live in New York or Connecticut or New Jersey, then you're going to have different different behavior patterns different and maybe pol policies, behavior patterns, policies, and and people self determine. Mm -hmm. And I think I thought that was very interesting. Him saying that if you want a free state, and we believe in states' rights, that's part of our <coughs> belief system in the United States, yeah. then you have a right to it. And the people elsewhere shouldn't have the ability to tell you what to do. When I was visiting uh, the Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. last month, I came across, um, and it's an anonymous quotation, but it was on the wall leading into a couple of exhibits about our American culture. And I wanted to read that to you because it, it says a lot to me about freedom and individual purpose, but also working together. The quote is, we have dreams of America, the nation. It almost sounds like Mark, Martin Luther King. You know, yeah. I have a dream. Speech. Yeah. But it's an anonymous uh, person who, who they've quoted here. We have dreams of America, the nation of opportunity, the land of promise. We work and move and struggle to realize our dreams. We build, we rebuild, we succeed, we fail. We agree, we disagree. We change, we learn. We make the United States together. So through all of this turmoil, agreeing, disagreeing, struggling, we have dreams, we have purpose, uh, we feel like it's a land of promise, but we it's not an easy proposition. No. Is it? Not an easy proposition. No. But freedom never is. Freedom never is. It, 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 it costs something, and we have to always guard it. What's the saying? The price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Correct. So that's, that's the three points I wanted to make about... Um, freedom. Freedom, yeah. Our flag. What's its nickname in history? Ah, it's called Old Glory. 
That's the nickname. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Uh, Betsy Ross is uh, the woman who apparently sewed the flag together and made the flag. And uh, Congress came to her in May of 1777. And between May of 1777 and the end of June 1777, she put this flag together. And the uh, <clears throat> Congress read the uh, independence, constitu the Constitution uh, on July 4th, 1776. And the flag was ready for July 4th, 1776. Mm -hmm. Isn't that incredible? You continue the history lesson. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. But then there's another another person I want to mention uh, about the flag. There's a woman by the name of <clears throat> Mary uh, Pickersgill, who was a Baltimore flag maker. And she was enamored by the broad stripes and the bright stars on of Old Glory. And a garrison commander from Fort McHenry in Baltimore came to her and said, we'd like to have just a garrison flag for Fort McHenry here in Baltimore. So she makes this flag that is 30 feet by 42 feet. Each, each stripe was like two feet wide, and the stars were a foot across, 12 inches across. They wanted to hang this from the garrison to have a huge display of, of a flag. Is that still around? Uh, I think remnants of it are in the museum, yeah. And so she, she makes this flag and it's put into, or put on the garrison, uh, I think a year before the British came in 1814 and assaulted Fort McHenry. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and of course, when it was assaulted by, by the British, the, the British withdrew from Fort McHenry. But guess who watched the bombing of uh, Fort McHenry and the struggle from the ship? The guy who from... wrote the words for the uh, uh, national anthem. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, one for me. <laughs> oh my goodness. So <clears throat> there's something about the national anthem that's interesting. Uh, <clears throat> You know, the national anthem actually comes in uh, four stanzas. We only sing one. One. Oh, I need to make one correction. The, the flag that Mary Pickersville made was called the Star Spangled Banner. Okay. And because the flag was named that that flew on the garrison at Fort McHenry that repelled the British, whenever Francis Scott Key did his poem and his song, he named it the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, he borrowed it from her. Borrowed it from her. So what's interesting, I think, Fred, and I, I think I mentioned this to you one other time when we were talking, is that it doesn't just end <clears throat> uh, with what most people understand as being the end of it. I mean, it, go, it goes on for four more verses. Verses, yeah. It's not just over the land of the free and home of the brave. It goes on to talk about on the shore dimly seen through the mists of the deep where the foe's haughty host in dread silence reposes. What is that which the breeze or the towering steep as it fitfully blows, half conceals, half discloses? It goes on and on and on. And when I read and Googled some of the uh, people who've talked about why has it been shortened to just the first stanza it was because americans are impatient americans will say things like oh if we if we sang all four stanzas then we'd never get to the baseball game <laughs> i mean really or you know they can't wait three or four more minutes for the rest of the song to be sung it has to be one stanza so we can get on with baseball football basketball soccer you know that this is old news, but even as a baseball fanatic, I could have listened to all four stanzas <laughs> to honor our country. I would implore our viewers, I really would, to go and find the four stanzas of the Star Spangled Banner. You'll find it really interesting. There are a lot of interesting references, uh, some of which I understand why people might think it was... Uh, to do with discrimination or warfare, and they didn't like the sound of some of the words. But yeah. 
one of the phrases it is a home and a country should leave us no more their blood has washed out their foul footsteps pollution uh, no refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave i mean there is some pretty this dark, is heavy it's heavy stuff but it re, it does uh harken back to uh why the country was started with was being a christian nation or in god we trust Oh, thus be it ever when freemen shall stand, free men, that's all of us in America, shall stand between their loved home and the war's desolation. We're trying to keep war away from home. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven rescued land, heaven rescued this land that we live in. Mm -hmm. Praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just. And this be our motto, in God is our trust. And that's actually on all U.S. coins. In God We Trust is on every U.S. coin. <clears throat> and the star, banner, star Spangled Banner in triumph shall wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave. So that's my well little done. Real research on, on the flag yeah. and, the pledge, and the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, what do you think we should finish with, Fred? Oh, I thought you'd never ask. The Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. Do you have some historical background on that, or should we just go into it? No, I, we're gonna. I'm gonna give you some information on that. Okay. So, um, it was actually written in 1892 by a uh, socialist Baptist minister. A socialist Baptist a minister. Socialist That's the Baptist. first time I've ever heard those words put together. That's not heresy to a Methodist or a Catholic or a Muslim or a Buddhist. He, he was a Baptist minister, yeah. <clears throat> and he had a good cause. His cause was to write these words, <clears throat> which would be generic, and he had hoped <clears throat> it would be adopted by other countries as kind of a basic pledge to their country. So his purpose was to be very generic at that time. <clears throat> Uh, it was changed over the years, once in uh, 1923, whenever the words, uh, <clears throat> the flag of the United States of America, were, those words were inserted. And then Eisenhower, uh, President Eisenhower in 1954, asked for uh, un under God to be put in the Pledge of Allegiance. 1954? Mm -hmm. So now the Pledge of Allegiance reads as follows. <clears throat> And if you're in uh, any kind of public setting, you're supposed to stand facing the flag and putting your hand over your, your heart. Over your heart. This reminds me when I was in elementary school. We began yes. every morning before yeah. school yeah. in our classrooms saying the Pledge of Allegiance. We stood. Mm -hmm. There was a flag in every room. Yes, I remember that. When my mother retired from teaching, uh, she taught for about 34, 35 years. Uh, she had a small little flag that had a little stand that she put the flag in and she took that from her classroom and kept it at home for years and years and years. And I still have it in my oh, Graham treasures. What a great heirloom that is. That was her little flag. It wasn't a big flag, but she put it on her desk. Mm -hmm. And whenever the Pledge of Allegiance was said, mm -hmm. all the mm -hmm. students did yeah. that. Yeah. Now, I also did some research on that, Fred. And it's actually uh, a little wishy-washy, but um, all of the all of the states have uh, laws about saying the Pledge of Allegiance. They were but, back to states' rights. But in each state, and sometimes even each county, the school board can have a say as to whether it's said or not. Uh, which kind of is discouraging that it's not really almost mandated. It's not but, nationalized. But it's not. It's is not mandated because it's there in each state's regulations, mm. but then the school boards and local yeah. individuals who control the boards tend to um, water that down, yeah. which may or not be a good thing. So it never got nationalized by the federal government. No, it's not a, it's not, not, not uh, federalized. So we're going to say the Pledge of Allegiance and sign off on what has been a, a wonderful day, July fourth. Uh, I, I look forward to another one. Same to you. I do. I just want to throw in uh, 
little side note. Can you show your um, tie, please? Oh, you audience? want to show the tie? Yeah. Well, uh, this is uh, not hearsay or heresy, I should say. This is not heresy, but this this tie was given to me by none other than Dr. Graham Morgan, who is an Australian who is since deceased, but I wear this tie every year on July 4th in remembrance of him, but he was one of my very, very best Australian buddies, and he was also the godfather of my eldest daughter. And before we say the Pledge of Allegiance, I just want to say that I have red, white, and blue. You do, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say that. Pledge. Here we go. You ready? Yes. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to, and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.